I'm very excited by how we've used the Soul Matters material through this church here. These materials have been great resources and a wonderful way to get a large portion of the community all on the same page in terms of what we're talking about, thinking, learning, and exploring. Yet, I also have some questions, not because the resources aren't excellent. My questions come from the fact that out of all the many resources on Beloved Community, only one names Josiah Royce. I'll give you a heads up that this message is definitely more on the academic side of things. But I hope it's informative and piques your interest to keep learning and growing in how you understand what it is to live Beloved Community. So, had it not been for Josiah Royce, we wouldn't even be talking about Beloved Community. We might have some other phrase or framing. What's more, so often in the race to talk about Martin Luther King Jr., we breeze past Josiah Royce as simply the person who coined the phrase Beloved Community. And it's just not that simple. Josiah Royce was born in Grass Valley, California in 1855. He was a child of English immigrants who moved to the West as part of the wave of Europeans seeking gold and land in the project of Manifest Destiny that displaced and devastated Native communities in the 19th century. Royce was educated first in San Francisco and then attended the University of California at Oakland and eventually earned a PhD from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, where his dissertation was of the interdependence of the principles of knowledge. He was then an assistant at the University of California at Berkeley. Eventually, he began publishing and ultimately was invited to the Harvard faculty to temporarily replace William James. In 1885, he was appointed permanent assistant professor. Over the course of his life, his work included lectures, multiple books and textbooks, several novels, and a wide range of philosophical writing. Much of his work that we reference today focuses on late 19th century ideas about the philosophical nature of ontology, that is, the nature of being. Essays and collection, collections include titles like The Conception of God and Studies of Good and Evil, and toward the end of his life, the book where we get the beloved community, the problem of Christianity. As a side note, Royce was a longtime Cambridge resident, with his final home being 103 Irving Street, which, in addition to being a few houses down on the backside of 6 Francis Avenue, the former parsonage of First Parish, his former house was most notably Julia Child's home from where she filmed her famous cooking shows. The phrase beloved community first appears in this passage from The Problem of Christianity in 1913. Royce writes, The power that gives to the Christian convert the new loyalty is what the apostle Paul call, calls grace. And the community to which, when grace saves him, the convert is thenceforth to be loyal, we may here venture to call by a name which we have not hitherto used. Let this name be the Beloved Community. This is another name for what we before called the Universal Community. Only now, the Universal Community will appear to us in a new light in view of its relations to the doctrine of grace. It's a pretty intense book. And unless you are a big fan of the studies of philosophy, ontology, theology, and divinity, it will bore, confuse, and probably frustrate you. But for those of us, us who are so inclined, it's actually a pretty interesting mental exercise. What is most notable, notable to me, though, is how much of this writing feels like a real culmination of so much of Royce's other thinking and writing. The idea of the beloved community being the way to describe the coming together of his ideas about loyalty, where we are compelled to a sense of loyalty that transcends individual difference and looks only to our shared humanity, his ideas about divine grace, where God is revealed to us through this loyalty, his ideas about community, 
quote, so precious and so difficult to create and, quote, a mystery of living, loving membership in a community whose meaning seems divine. Even ideas about faith and science. His final paragraph of the book sounds surprisingly modern and even humanist, coming at the end of such a Christian-centric book. He says, we can look forward then to no final form, either of Christianity or of any other special religion, but we can look forward to a time when the work and the insight of religion can become as progressive as is now the work of science. It's tempting to hear shades of what we generally gravitate to in Martin Luther King Jr.'s approach to the beloved community in these quotes. But again, it's not that simple. <clears throat> Josiah Royce also wrote an earlier essay titled Race Questions and Prejudice, along with other writing about American, read Anglo-Saxon, exceptionalism and assimilation. From Race Questions, Royce states, Let us then provisionally admit at this stage of our discussion that the Negro is in his present backward state as a race for reasons which are not due merely to circumstances, but which are quite innate in his mental constitution. For the moment, let that view pass as if it were finally accepted. View the Negro then for the instant merely as a backward race. I don't want to be accused of cherry-picking inflammatory quotes from his work, so I will link to all of these references in the description below this recording and let you determine your thoughts about Royce for yourself. I will also direct you to scholar Dr. Tommy Curry's work, Another White Man's Burden, Josiah Royce's Quest for a Philosophy of White Racial Empire. Curry is also the author of the book The Man Not, Race, Class, Genre, and the Dilemmas of Black Manhood. Curry's modern scholarship makes it clear that it is impossible to really truly understand Royce without understanding him as someone who held deeply imperialistic and highly racialized, indeed, racist views. In his essay, Some Characteristic Tendencies of American Civilization from 1900, Royce offers this reflection on the post-Civil War South. He says, In the South, the story of the Civil War, a war so earnestly fought out to the point of an absolutely honorable, because inevitable, defeat, this story, I say, now survives in the ideals of the new generation of Southerners as a very precious memory of heroism and endurance. In the same essay, Royce makes reference to the South African conflict that would result in apartheid, expressing the wish for the British that your empire might become not only the protector of alien subjects, but the assimilator of men, kindred, kindred blood, excuse me, men of kindred blood, and the object of a common loyalty, even to those who now perhaps fail to comprehend their true share in your destiny. We could simply dismiss Royce's ideas about race as him being a man of his times, or we could do what our beloved community materials and so much UU scholarship does, just skip over him. We can justify this action by recognizing that Royce doesn't represent our modern values, though we use his words. We could also look to Martin Luther King Jr., whose ideas on the beloved community, coming through the filter of Dr. Howard Thurman, differed from Royce in that King never equated the community with God. Rather, lifting God outside of the intimacies of human relationships and placing God as the motivation and inspiration for the actions, specifically nonviolence, again inspiration from Thurman, that result in beloved community. Yes, we could do that. Or we could face 
how the conundrum of a racist Josiah Royce being the originator of some of our most cherished language parallels the Unitarian Universalist ongoing effort to reconcile our glorious liberal faith tradition with lived histories of colonialism, oppression, white supremacy, sexism, ableism, and more. What if, in our own Unitarian Universalist scholarship, we actively and intentionally held this kind of complexity as part of how our faith manifests? This is the call to a mature faith expression that so many of us are hungry for. It tells us not to be satisfied with mere statements of equity or hopes and dreams, but it provides us with tools and living exercises that show us in real time what it means to live the complexity. I'm sometimes criticized for interrogating the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., but I only do so because he comes directly from a tradition that invites robust interrogation and exploration. I'm convinced that if we are to do more than simply talk about King as an exercise, but instead live as he and other prophets of true peace have asked us to live, we have to be willing and well-practiced at interrogating our more suspect and sometimes non-flattering sides. Holding on to the discomfort of the legacies of racism is not just about being able to say it aloud. It means recognizing how the history, the well of our very knowledge, our way of being, and even our language are tinged with this poison, and more importantly, how we have all consumed water from that well. And it means we can't just throw out the water or walk away from the well. If we turn away from it, the same poisoned water in that well will leach even more deeply into the soil and become part of everything that grows around it. No, we have to get into the well, get into the soil, and figure out where the poison begins and deal with it for real. Josiah Royce is and was problematic. He was a Harvard professor. He was literally part of our extended community here in Cambridge. By his own writing, he held racist views about non-white people as well as limited views shaped by the insistence on assimilation by non-Anglo-Saxon whites. One has to wonder, in this light, if Royce's beloved community was always assumed to be all white. Can we separate the words from where they were born? At the same time, Royce thought deeply about the nature of being and human relationships and what they could mean for the future of humanity. There are useful tools in his work, even if he did apply them inequitably and with tragic bias. He was also part of the same philosophical lineage that ultimately produced the brilliance of Martin Luther King Jr. King and Royce share the words beloved community, and yet they're so very far apart. Indeed, there is more than just time between these two thinkers. There is real cultural and philosophical tension. You could even call it a fracture. And quite possibly, it is that tension, that chasm between black and white, God and not God, that invites what we can actually learn from these words. It would seem then that our highest goal is learning how to bridge the gap between beloved community and beloved community. May it be so.